Hi there, this is Groovy and and welcome back to my channel. Okay, so I'm going to do a continuation of the last tutorial I put up about jungle breaks and using the offset command. Here I've taken the project further and I've really worked on these drums and I've put some pads with them. It's actually quite near completion this project but it hasn't got any bass yet. So I'm just going to play you a little clip of the song now and then we can jump right into the tutorial. Okay, so I think it's sounding really nice. It definitely needs uh, an 808 bass or something just to keep it rolling and, and give it some nice subs, but I've left that to the last stage. I really just wanted to show you all these tricks and techniques I've been doing with the drums. So I'm gonna go through things one by one now and I will try and show you examples of each of these techniques as we go through them. Okay, so first I wanna talk about gating. now. When we use the word gating, there's actually a few different things we're referring to. In here, I'm actually using more like a noise gate, or even I think I'm using a transient shaper here to gate the signal and cut off some of the tails of the samples. But you also have gating effects, which gives you a kind of stuttering effect. And I've actually used both of those things in this project and I will show you now. So in this intro section, I've got the same Apache triggering the same instrument that I jump into later in the song. But in order to make it a little bit lighter and give it a little bit of a different feeling to the main drums in the track, I have used a, if I go across here, I have used, I've used filters and I've also used this thing called Neutron Elements and it has a transient shape in it. I've just pulled a lot of the sustain out of this track. And if I solo this track here, if I take this off, it's just stunting some of the hits and cutting off the tails and a lot of the big room sound that I didn't want in this intro section. I've also filtered a lot of this low end out. The other type of gating I've used, and there's a few ways to do this in Renoise, but I've actually used this CXX command, which is cutting the sample. The first number in the column is gonna tell you the new volume that you want to cut to, and the second number is gonna tell you at how long you wanna let the slice play for before you cut it. So for this effect in my project, I've actually been quite subtle with this and I've got a, a gating effect which is, which is cutting more and more of the sound over time and this is how it's sounding. So it's cool, it's, it's working really well with this kind of volume roll that I'm also doing with the notes. Okay, so another very common jungle technique that they used to do back in the day is filtering. And you can do all kind of crazy effects with filtering and comb filtering and things like that. But actually just low pass filter sweeps are super common and they're actually used in all types of music. But there's a few ways to do it in Renoise and you would have seen me quite often filtering where you put a, um, you right click on the filter cutoff and then you go to the end and then you can bring it up and 
I'm using Alt and Shift and pressing Home. And then I can just select this column and then Command I and interpolate it. And so you'll get this filter rising effect as you can see there. But actually for doing filter sweeps that are spanning multiple patterns, it gets a bit confusing because you have to sort of go to the end and put a certain number at the end and you've got to remember it, come to your next one and then copy it down and you've got to kind of jigsaw it together. So actually a slightly better technique for doing longer filter sweeps, and, and that's what I've done here, is to actually use an LFO and assign it to the filter cutoff. You can make the LFO do a kind of enveloping, a one-shot envelope, and that can span a lot further. Now I've put a value of 128 lines in there, and that's how much it's gonna span in my project. So it's basically gonna do this whole eight bar pattern with one long envelope. And the only other thing you've got to remember is to right click on reset at the start where you want your filter to reset. And so it will trigger from naught when I when I reset it at the start of this pattern. So if I just play this. Okay, on to the next thing. Now, this is a technique that lots of people use, but Fotech really use this technique to the absolute maximum. And I take a lot of inspiration from artists like that. It's where you, you, you have a drum break rolling and you kind of stop your drum break and then you use a big reverb percussion hit, usually something metallic or a bit dusty and and messed up. And you can take these from films or just mess with sample packs and distort them and saturate them. You have your drum break rolling and then you put in a big percussion hit and stop your drum break, have the percussion hit and then the drums continue again. And this is just a metal bell that I've put lots of reverb and delay and I've filtered it a bit. But also on my Apache track, I've used this X naught naught and that command just stops all the notes in their tracks. If you listen to the Apache, it just cuts the notes there straight away. And then you have the bell can come in and then you can go back to your break. And, and it's just breaking apart the monotony of just having a drum break rolling and rolling and rolling all the time. Right, so another very common technique to do with your drums is to extend certain hits. Now, when you have lots of 16th notes and really fast, crazy drums, it gives your ears a bit of a break and a bit of a, a release from all the tension of the fast drums to have a single hit which lasts quite a long time. And I've used lots of that in this track and there is a few techniques I wanna go through to achieve that. So if I just play you this little section, you'll understand what I mean. So I have that like the big roll and then and then it stops and you have some space again. And I've actually achieved that here with a manual reversing trick. So everyone will probably have heard of ping pong loops that you will do when, with drum chopping where it will play the drum uh, forwards and then it will, will reverse it when it gets to the end of the slice. Well, in Renoise, you can do that, and I could have gone to this hit here, which I've triggered, and I could have put on a ping pong loop, and if it hit the end of that slice, so if I actually take this off, it actually does it, and it might even have been a little bit cleaner than the kind of manual dirty way I've done it, but I've really tried to just use Techniques here harking back to the old Amiga, Pro Tracker, Octomed style of making drums. So with all my hits, I've really been using um, the slice command, apart from a few little added things I've thrown in. But I'm doing a kind of quick and dirty way to do your drums, and I was really going for that rough sound. And a lot of that is by these imperfections anyway. So here I'm using the backwards command. So my drum's gonna play forwards and I've just found a slice by moving this command around. So if I put it there, it's actually too late. So I've gotta come here. And if I take this away, you have that dead air where you have this big reverb of the kick and then you have this silence and it sounds really weird. One of the most obvious ways to extend your drum hits, but it's definitely worth mentioning, is actually by pitching them down. By pitching some down, you, you stretch it out. 
it's definitely got it further along the line. I could pitch it down and then reverse it. Maybe there. What you can also do with this backwards command is get quite sneaky with it. When you play a sample forwards and then you hit the backwards command, it will play forwards and then it'll hit the backwards command. But if you play the backwards command on a sample right from the start, it'll actually reverse. And you see it plays from a reverse position. So not only does it play from the reverse of the sample, but all of your SSX commands actually go in reverse as well. But you can use this to your advantage. So say I wanted to hit number 20. Well, the reverse of number 20 is actually E0. So if I go and put E0 on the first step that I have this backwards command, I can actually make sure that I reverse from this position. And you can sort of time your backwards effect. Uh, maybe I want to go, if I'm going E0, I would go E3 maybe. And I can get it closer and you can really fine tune where you want your reverse to come. What you can also do is a sort of quick and dirty time stretch where if I'm if I'm doing the reverse of B0, so you can kind of count through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 was 50. I can then, if I want to go, say, backwards, I can go from 50 to, it's kind of going from B0 to A2. So if I go 50 to 60, okay, and then if we look, Ah, it's because it's of what I didn't do was actually put the reverse command on all the hits. So we've got to do that again. So what I've actually done there is used a bit of granular time stretching to re-trigger the sample and, and to control its length. And you can get a bit further. If I say I wanted it to end at 50A maybe, then I can come and do this, interpolate again. And I'm getting a bit of a dirtier stretch that's actually not going quite as far into this whipping reverse snare sound. I very briefly mentioned ping pong loops earlier, but you can set these up on instruments, but you can only do it on instruments that have slice markers. So only ones uh, that have sli slice markers like this, I can uh, select a slice and then come in here and assign, say, ping pong loop, and then you can kind of tailor the start and end points. So another really obvious thing that I should have probably mentioned at the start is I'm actually, whilst I've time stretched and I've pitched up the breaks that I'm using for this project, I've also kept the original drum break, which I haven't done anything to. And I can come in here and just select a hit or I can just trigger this instrument and use the drum break at its original speed for one long hit. And this is giving me a much bigger hit to use at the start of my song. Another very common technique that gives you really great results is to actually use a big mono reverb. And we can set that up. I really like using this convolution reverb in Renoise. And I have some quite big spaces. Um, if I go for, say, a fat plate. And what I like to do is actually to let the hit of the drum sound cleanly and then to bring up a reverb, I think is a slightly cleaner way to implement this effect. So maybe we kind of go like this and let's put that on there. Let's just try this. I can adjust the gain. It's nearly making it there. It maybe wants to go a little bit higher up to here maybe. Let's try this. So I'm letting the, the actual transient and the punch of the kick come through and then I'm smothering it with reverb as it goes. Now I can right click and just render this thing to a sample, this reverb kick, and I have this big kick now and so I don't have to worry with this track anymore. I can just delete that track away and come back and trigger that kick. Those are my kind of main tricks for extending drum hits. You've got pitching down the sample, got ping pong loops, you've got big mono reverbs, and you've got the quick and dirty re-noise forwards, backwards uh, stuff that you can do where you're sampling other hits and, and reversing from specific points in the tracks. One final way to extend your drum hits, and this is more of an effect than it is a subtle way, is to do time stretch effects. Now in re-noise, the way to do this is to actually re-trigger your instrument loads and loads of times 
and then to slowly move through the slice command or the sample offset command to a specific point. And if I show you the sample here as it happens, you can get a really cool stuttering, old school sounding time stretch effect. To do this is just to put S00 at the bottom and then select all the way down to the point you want to time stretch at. And you can just start to mess with this number I've gone for nine there, but you can start to kind of play around with the bottom values and just keep interpolating the sample. So that might have even been cooler than the one I had before in my track. Another cool thing you can do with this time stretch effect is actually control the sort of time or the length of certain hits. And I've done this here with, I have a, a riser sound actually and it wasn't quite fitting with my track. This is just a riser here, but it was happening too quick for my song and I wanted it to, to hit at this mark, but I wanted it to last a little bit longer. So I've actually used a sort of dirty time stretch to make this and it gets a bit grainy and jittery, but if you smother it, smother it with reverb and I've rolled a bit of the top off there, you don't notice it quite as much and, and this works really well because it's the same as I had before. You can just select it all and go to this bottom number and just start to time it until it fits with your track. Whilst we often use loops to do things like ping pong loops and to extend the samples, we can also use them as an effect. And here what I've done is I've actually just taken, I think I've taken a render of potentially this. And what I've actually done here is just created a little loop, but then with the loop I have, I've done a bit of uh, band pass modulation and I've also done some pitch modulation and I'm also sending this effect out uh, the left side and I'm matching it with another effect I'm sending out the right side. So you have the two effects in the middle and then they're panning out as they go through the, the effect. And this is how it sounds here. I could have maybe timed them a bit better, but... Maybe we try and move that one up here. That's a bit cooler maybe. Yeah, so what I, what I really wanted to demonstrate here was actually, I've just created a little loop with the start and end point. Right, on to the next thing. We have drum rolls. Now, I go back to a few common techniques. One is just to do a very standard roll all the way up from nothing. Rising to a certain point where I'm just interpolating the, the bottom value to the top one and then I'm getting this result. Another technique I use quite a lot for snares is to have a loud snare and then soft, medium, soft, medium, and then loud again. And that gives you another cool effect. And then finally, I do a low, medium, high one quite often as well. Here I've done, actually done it in eighth notes, but it works very well for 16th notes as well, just to give a short rising uh, roll, drum roll. And that actually brings me on to my next point where this isn't a hard and fast rule, but I think it's quite a good thing to think about and to uh, potentially play with is that I, I very rarely try and have two hits of the same drum playing the same hit at the same velocity right next to each other. So here I've got three snares at the same pitch and I've actually just on this middle snare, I've just put it down a little bit in velocity and it makes a huge difference. If I take this away, it actually just makes it sound much more robotic having three hits, same velocity, same instrument, same pitch, just hitting one after another. So just putting little volume differences 
with say, with the same sounding hits that are next to each other can really help. It doesn't matter so much if they're further distances away. If you start getting uh, sort of quarter note distances or eighth note distances, it doesn't matter so much. But definitely when you're doing 16th notes next to each other, just having little velocity differences makes a massive, massive difference. Another effect that is quite common is to use echoes and a little bit like where you can stop your main drums and have a percussion hit, you can also stop your drums and have a, a, an echoed hit. Just like I just showed you with the echoed hit or the delayed hit, you can also do a big reverb throw or a big reverb hit. And here I've actually just made a new track to put the verb on and I'm doing kind of similar to the way I did my my mono reverb for my drum hits. I like having the actual hit pretty clean and then the big reverb comes in after. And by the sounds of it, it looks like here I have taken my original uh, reverbed hit and then I've reversed it so I would have right click and rendered this hit out and then if I go to this one I've got a reversing hit but I've actually put a loop marker in as well so when I trigger it if I trigger the right key I get a loop and that's really helpful because I've, I'm sure I've gone and done here we go I think what I wanted to do was add some release to the sample and so by putting a loop point in, you can really control. I wanted it to just ring out into the start of the next passage a little bit. And sort of bringing this stuff all together, I have obviously showed you examples, but Quite often in doing these techniques, I will render a little, render something to a sample and then take it onto a new track and start messing with more effects. And I often go into the modulations tab and I often mess with pitch envelopes. And I've definitely, I've here you can see I've tried to go down with a pitch envelope, but I actually ended up going, going up with it. And so, that's a really just a getting a little bit cooler techniques. You know, if I take away that pitch envelope, it's probably going to sound quite boring. Still sounds quite cool, actually, but it definitely adds another little extra bit of sweetness to the sound, having that pitch modulation going up with an envelope. So the final thing I want to talk about, and I actually just discovered a really cool technique for this through the making of this tutorial. So once again, making these tutorials is really helping me with my own workflow and my own skill set. But what I want to talk about is actually break swapping. Now, there's lots of ways to do this. You can use other breaks to give you fill effects, or you can layer two breaks on top of each other, or you can actually just have one break playing like I have in this song. And then for another section of the song to give some variation, you can have another break coming in. So if I play you this little segment here. have that think break coming in and it just completely changes the mood and, and really launches you into this new passage. But I, I had a bit of a problem. So I had this think break here playing, but then I wanted to take this a step further and actually layer it with an amen break in this next section. Now, traditionally to do this, you would think you would have to copy all of these hits to a, to an Amen track and sort of figure out how the Amen was going to work with the Think Break and really go in and, and start pitching all the hits around in the Amen. Complete nightmare. It would have been it's really hard to align everything. And I did actually try that method and it just wasn't working for me at all. 
So this is what kind of pushed me towards this, this technique. So I'll show you quickly now the result of combining the Amen and the Think Break, and then I'll, I'll walk you through the technique. It's a reflection of the reality of an individual who seeks to portray through his or her music, and I cannot see how it can be a negative thing. So it sounds really cool. It gives it another lift. It's it's uh, adding more percussion, and the, the the amen has got a really nice sort of ride going on in there. So I, I thought if I have this think loop here, if I created another loop exactly the same length as this think break, and layered the amen with it, and then just exported it as a single sample, then I would have a composite of the amen and the think. But if it was exactly the same length as this think break and all the hits were in exactly the same place, then I would be able to just swap out this original think break sample, which I have here. And then what I've done is I've made this composite break and which is here. And I can just swap from that instrument to this instrument and everything's going to align properly. So to do this, I've actually had to go into logic. And if I solo some of this. And what I've done here is I've actually done a bit of cleaning of the break as well. I just started hearing some horrible resonances and things weren't, weren't merging together that well. And you can see I've got actually three EQs. I'm all dipping out in this low, mids, muddy region. I'm also doing a low pass filter there, or a high pass filter there even. So I've used this moment to actually clean up this thing a little bit as well. And I've layered a amen over it. Now it still has a bit of a weird sort of stunted kick thing going on. And I was finding it hard. I was really going in and trying to sort of phase line. You can see I've been nudging around this amen and I'm sort of looking at how the waveforms are matching up. And I'm trying to roughly, if you can see like this waveforms going up and this one's going up. And then I'm sort of losing it there. And then it's sort of doing some phase inverting and it's running out. But for, for at least the start and the transient of the hit, it's sounding, it should be quite in phase. But that still wasn't really working for me. So I've had to go and actually find a kick drum as well. And if I play the whole thing, It's definitely not perfect and that first kick has a little bit of a stuttering to it but it's about as good as I could do in this. I don't think I spent too long doing this. I just wanted to get get the idea out there. One thing I do want to show you and it really highlights why programs like Logic and Ableton are much better for doing these quite intense sound design practices is that by putting slicing mode on this Amen, what I want to do is have the, the think break be completely as it is. I don't want to move any of those hits because that's going to mess up the whole idea. But in Logic, if I put a flex mark on it, I can actually drag it down and align the hit to the one in the other break. And I sort of just went through, I think, and aligned all the hits up and just got everything running completely synced up with the think break. So if I play these now, so this, this snare seems to be hitting a little bit later. Getting a bit of flamming on this hit as well. So you have to do a bit of manually manual adjusting. In this instance, I haven't even layered the drums. I haven't done any EQing. All I've done is match the hits of the, the Amen and the Think Break. And I've got a very, very workable break that I can take back to Renoise. So all I did was bounce the two breaks and export the audio file back to Renoise and then dragged it into my project. And so then all I had to do, which was the final step, was actually just to swap the old instrument. So I, this one's now triggering 2A, but this one is triggering 0A. And I can sort of very easily show you how it would have sounded before if I just put 0 at some of these values. 
simple. So it's actually such an easy technique to layer your drums with where you're not having to do all this confusing matching up of different drums. I think this is a much cleaner and tighter way to do it. So I, d I thought that would definitely be worth chucking into this tutorial. Okay, so I think that's all for me today. I've really tried to throw everything I know into these two tutorials. And there's loads of tricks in there for you to bring into your own skill set and to explore on your own. I've really just tried to demonstrate them here. Nothing I'm talking about I've invented. I've really just gone on a bit of a discovery through forums and watching other people's tutorials and just trying to learn as much as I can about these old school drum breaks techniques. So I hope that was useful for some of you anyway, and I'll catch you soon on my channel. Peace.